led this national fight to end discrimination in the Boy Scouts. And after we won that, I finished my degree, and I went and worked in the Obama White House uh, as a, an intern for a summer. Uh, and then after that, um, we finished the, the Boy Scouts fight, and then I went to graduate school uh, at Princeton to get my master's in public policy. And then 2016 happened. And I think probably like a lot of you, I will never forget where I was uh, on the night of the election and the morning after, as I started to realize that Donald Trump was gonna become president of the United States. And it was a really jarring experience because um, it was funny. I actually didn't have a strong emotional reaction immediately after. It, like it didn't, it didn't, it hadn't really sunk in. You know, I know some people like it was like were crying and what. I was just kind of like numb on election night. And it wasn't until I spoke with a former high school history teacher of mine named Mitch Gross. Uh, at my school at Iowa City West High, who was telling me about what was happening in the hallways that he was seeing, you know, kids who were Muslim, people of color being told things, like, you don't belong here, this isn't your country, go home, Trump's president, you know, and all this stuff, that it really connected me. If that's happening at a school like Iowa City West, which is in a very progressive community, like, what's happening in the rest of the country? And that was when it started to really occur to me how profoundly this election was going to impact an entire generation of young people. And I started to think about, like, what can I do? And so that next summer, I went to work for Jason Kander, who uh, was running for the U.S. Senate in Missouri, lost, and then started a new organization called Let America Vote to fight for voting rights all over America. I was their very first public policy fellow. And I spent the summer doing research and working with them to figure out what states we should be operating in. Iowa is actually now one of those states, and Let America Vote is doing phenomenal work. Um, and then, shortly after that, uh, our state senator, Bob Dvorsky, from the west side of Iowa City in Coralville, announced that he was retiring somewhat unexpectedly. And there were a couple of people who were thinking about running, and one of those people was actually my former high school history teacher, Mitch Gross. And when he decided he wasn't gonna run, he called me and said, Zach, I think you should run. And so I thought about it for a little bit, and then I wound up calling Senator Dvorsky and told him, you know, I, I think I might want to run for the seat. He was shocked, actually. He had no idea that it was even on my radar. Because I was like out in grad school, you know, land, so they, he wasn't, he, like, I'm not a real, not really on anybody's radar. Uh, and so when that opportunity presented itself, I decided that was the most I could do, was to actually get in the race. So uh, we launched the campaign in December of last year. Uh, I had to run in a primary election while finishing my master's degree in a different uh, time zone. Do not recommend. Uh, <laughs> if you can avoid that, you should. Uh, but we were able to make it work. And it's fun, funny, uh, graduation day was the same day as the primary election. So I spent six months telling people I wasn't able to walk, but I was able to run. So um, the, uh, we, we were able to win, win the Democratic primary in June uh, with 60% of the vote. And then um, now we're moving on to the general election. I don't actually have a Republican opponent. I'm running against a Libertarian uh, named Carl, uh, Carl Crambeck from Clarence, Iowa, which is a town of about a thousand people out in Cedar County, the more rural part of my district. I was in Clarence this morning and it doesn't seem like a whole lot of people know who Carl is, even though he's from there, so I feel pretty good about our chances of winning, uh, which is great. And that means that I've been able to spend most of my time supporting other Democrats who are running in, in Iowa, people who have more competitive elections. Um, you know, you're probably all familiar with the, the gubernatorial race here, Fred Hubble uh, running for governor. Um, we've also got some competitive House races, I hope. Uh, Colin, are you from Dubuque? Or no, who's from Dubuque? No, it's H uh, Hudson, sorry. I uh, hope you know, you registered to vote in Dubuque. Um, you know, we got a competitive race up in Dubuque, uh, in that Northeast Iowa, where my mom's from, uh, Southwest Iowa, Des Moines, we got Cindy Axe running against David Young. Um, and then we've got the entire Iowa legislature. Every single House seat is on the ballot this November. Half of the Senate seats are. Now, uh, Republicans have a pretty strong majority right now, 30-20, so it'll be hard to dislodge them all in one election, uh, but we've got some, some real exciting opportunities. So I'm just going all over the state right now, knocking on doors for other candidates, uh, spending time here too, especially in these last few weeks, uh, supporting people here, but um, we're, we're in, in an interesting place. Uh, I'll say a few things quickly about policy, and then I want to have a conversation here. I don't want to just talk at you all night. You get enough lectures in class. My platform is focused especially as AJ said, on education, healthcare, and workers' rights. Uh, on the education piece, you know, I think that we've been underinvesting in our K-12 schools for a long time. We were chatting uh, briefly about what we've seen in Davenport 
uh, and some of the things that have happened there with um, a, a clear need for more money to be spent and uh, not being able to do that. Uh, obviously, the higher education level, you know, we've seen over $100 million sucked out of our Board of Regents schools, Iowa State University of Iowa, you and I, uh, over the last decade, and that's having some really big consequences. The one thing that always kind of drives me a little crazy and it just floors me whenever I think about it, you know, this is a national average, not an Iowa average, but nationally, the cost of a four-year degree from a public institution like the University of Iowa for the baby boomer generation, the cost of tuition is equivalent to 300 minimum wage hours worth of work. So it's like a summer, right, 300 hours. For our generation, it's 4,500 minimum wage hours worth of work, right? That is not a summer. <laughs> Um, and so we are just in a totally different uh, universe when it comes to the cost of higher education. And unfortunately, increasingly, higher education is no longer a ladder, it's a gateway. And so people who uh, were able to climb that ladder in the past are pulling it up behind them, and they're forcing people to go through the gate, and they're controlling who gets through and who doesn't get through. And that's terrible for our economy. Uh, and those of us who are fortunate enough to graduate from college are in a really good position, but we gotta remember, almost half of our entire generation will not graduate from college. Right? Uh, so uh, there is a, a bifurcation that is occurring and uh, we have to be very cognizant of the impact that that's gonna have on people. Uh, on the healthcare piece, there are a lot of issues in our state that are, are really problematic. I'll focus on two big ones. Um, mental health uh, is, is a huge issue. I hear about it all the time when I'm knocking on doors. I'm knocking on 3,000 some doors at this point uh, and the mental health comes up a lot. Thanks for being here, have a good night. Um, the other big issue is Medicaid privatization. So uh, three years ago, we took our state-operated public health insurance program for low-income folks, we handed it over to some for-profit uh, health insurance companies and said, you guys can go ahead and run the program and you can run it for four times more money uh, than the state was running it for. We were running it 3% administrative overhead, they're running it at 12% administrative overhead. Uh, and the only way to do that and make a profit, and they do make a profit, United Healthcare CEO, who's one of the big uh, managed care organizations, makes $40 million a year, which is bananas. Um, the only way you can do that and actually make money is by denying claims. That's exactly what's happened. So our most vulnerable citizens who depend on public health insurance uh, are not getting the benefits that they need, the protection they need from our government. And so reversing Medicaid and privatization is a huge issue. Uh, the last one, uh, workers' rights, there are two big areas where I'm really focused on. Uh, the first one is minimum wage. Uh, you know, Johnson County raised the minimum wage to 10, 10 an hour, uh, and then the Republicans, the party of local control, sensibly stepped in and said, nope, you can't do that. Got to go back to 725 an hour, which is the state minimum wage. Um, and that's uh, uh, something that really troubles me. The second thing, this might not hit at home but closely to all of you, but any of you want to be a teacher at some point, maybe? Yeah, JP, maybe. So, um, collective bargaining for state employees is a huge issue. So basically, if you have a union, you gotta negotiate over all kinds of things, wages, benefits, safety, training, all that stuff. And the Republicans basically changed it so you can only negotiate over salary and wages, uh, which dramatically limits the scope and gives management a lot more power in that negotiation. And one of the big problems in our economy, I so um, I'm gonna draw a chart real quick. Um, there's a, a chart that is just, I think, really, um, really uh, troubling. This is basically percent change, and this is uh, time. So starting in the post-war period after 1945, um, this is the growth in productivity of our economy. So um, over time, our economy's gotten like 200% more productive, which is great. More productivity, good. Uh, for the first 30 or so years, 35 years after, at uh, first 30 years after World War II, hourly compensation, so like wages, grew at basically one for one with productivity, starting in like 1973 or so, it basically tapered off. And so as a result, um, people who are in non-supervisory roles, so people who are like wage workers, they basically haven't gotten a raise since 1973. Now, a lot of the changes in compensation have gone to benefits. So like health insurance is the biggest one because healthcare costs are explode, exploding. Um, but basically, like workers who aren't in management are just getting the shaft. And yeah, our economy's in really bad shape. I mean, you're for people who have a college degree, it's fine, but for people who don't have a college degree, uh, it's not.
So um, that's actually why there's actually one. There's only one uh, demographic group in America that is currently experiencing a rising, or excuse me, a, a decreasing life expectancy rate. For everybody else, it's rising, and that's white people who don't have a college degree. And so, um, you know, uh, now to be to be very clear. Uh, white people without a college degree still have a higher life expectancy than uh, people of color without a college degree. But for people of color without a college degree, their life expectancy is going up, whereas for white people it's going down. So um, the, the bifurcation in our economy is a huge part of that problem. Um, I just threw a lot of information at you. Also, one last, one, uh, two last issues that have come up a lot while I've been out knocking on doors. Water quality is a big issue. Uh, I don't know if some of you have heard about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, or the fact that, like, you basically can't drink, for, like, I, you would not want to drink water from the Iowa River. Uh, basically, there's a huge amount of runoff of chemicals and, and manure uh, that goes from farm soil and also lawns, like in Iowa City, gets into the water, and it, it's all kinds of really bad stuff. And uh, Republicans spent, like, $230 million over 10 years. They had this big bill last year, which is a drop in the bucket. And we need to spend, like, between 4 and $6 billion on it. It's a huge, huge issue. Um, and it comes up a lot. Uh, the second and final, final thing is gun safety reform. Uh, after the Parkland shooting, I, I, the number of people I heard from, young people, old people, um, you know, I was, gun laws used to be pretty good. Republicans are moving us in the wrong direction. They've changed uh, a couple of things, but uh, we gotta figure out a way to have, you know, I grew up shooting rifles, shotguns, revolvers, and the Boy Scouts. And one of the things we were always taught was you gotta be responsible with your firearms. And I think it's just incredibly clear that our gun laws today are not responsible. Uh, and we need to make sure that, you know, we're not infringing on law-abiding citizens, Second Amendment rights. And at the same time, there are things that we have to do to make sure that people who should have guns can't get guns. Uh, and that's uh, definitely what we gotta work on too. So uh, I'll leave it there. Um, is there anybody in this room who is not registered to vote? and is willing, brave enough to admit that in front of their peers. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, just make sure that you all vote, because I mean, this is, and I know every politician says it, but this is literally the most important election in Iowa in at least the last 30 years, probably ever, and for our country, it is the most important election probably since 1932, when we were choosing, unfortunately, between Iowa's only president and Franklin Roosevelt. Um, but this is, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a big one, so. Uh, no pressure, but I hope that for the love of our state and our country, you will vote in November. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and talk and I'll stop lecturing you. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so obviously you have a lot of priorities, but I'm just curious, kind of what would your your pick, first priority pick one. be? Yeah. Uh, so healthcare is probably the top, top thing I want to work on. Uh, there are a lot of things that on day one, you know, uh, reversing the heartbeat bill, changing chapter 20, raising the, I mean, like all that stuff, but love to do that on day one. Uh, healthcare is gonna be a longer term thing, um, just because our system in Iowa right now is so broken for so many different reasons. It's gonna take a lot of sustained bipartisan work, and that is gonna, because, you know, it's really frustrating because um, there are a lot of things that we can do that should be bipartisan. So for example, a reinsurance program uh, to stabilize our individual marketplace uh, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Alaska have all adopted this, this reform. It's kind of wonky, but if you're an economics guy, um, you know, basically you're providing insurance to insurance companies and it stabilizes. This is what we do for crop insurance, by the way. The federal government does it, and we can do that as well for, for healthcare. Uh, we should do it for healthcare. Um, reversing Medicaid privatization, clearly it's a failed experiment. It hasn't worked, we're submitting more money, not less, and people aren't getting the benefits and protection they need. Um, mental health system, I think that the current, so uh, not too long, about a decade ago, county governments were responsible for paying for mental health services. Uh, then within the last, I think six or seven years ago, we switched to what's called a regional system. And so counties form little subunits and they work together. And the idea was that if you get counties together, you can like spread out the risk. The problem is every region has a different specification and like different paperwork to pay for stuff and so on the provider side if you're a doctor figuring out how you get all this stuff paid for it's super complicated and then you add privatization of Medicaid which often pays for mental health services and I mean it's it's a huge huge mess um, so I think moving to a single-payer system on the mental health side 
and eventually the long term a true universal health care system in America uh, that single payer is where we got to go um, there are disagreements about how to get there but it's clear I think that's the only way we're going to be able to control costs which are and prices which are rising and costs and prices are different things but um, that has to be I think health care is something I'm, I'm really excited to, to work on uh, and that won't just be a day one thing that'll be hopefully for me a long term thing yeah absolutely I don't know if I got your name in. Amin. Amin. Oh, yeah, oh, God, dude, Amin. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. How are you? How are you? Yeah. No, no, we're getting by. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So, keeping in mind the increasing rate of opioid related deaths in Iowa each year, yeah. um, what are some specific steps that you'd like to take to address the opi opioid epidemic that's going on, not just in Iowa, but across the United States? So there are three things that we should do. The first one is we have to be looking at safe needle exchanges. So currently there's an underground uh, needle exchange being run by a group of University of Iowa medical students called the Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition. And they're doing life, it is not an exaggeration, they're doing life saving work. Um, they actually, uh, I, would, I participated in um, one of their, um, their programs and um, we have to watch them in action distributing um, uh, their supplies, including uh, the second thing, which is naloxone, is a drug, uh, a, a good drug that, that reverses o uh, overdose deaths. There are some uh, police departments, first responders, are starting to have that uh, on them. I think there's more first responders using it. And the third thing is uh, introducing residential treatment um, drug, uh, residential treatment for um, opioid addiction to our Medicaid program. Now, this is hard, harder to do when you got the managed care part of it going on. And um, just to explain how managed care works briefly, so it's all, the government's still paying for the money. They just give the money to this for-profit company and they say, all right, here's your money for this population. Give everybody the treatment they need and whatever you don't spend, you can keep it, right? That's basically how it works. And it creates an incentive, right, for them to you know, use more efficiency, whatever, on the private side. Uh, the problem is that it screws up the incentives, right? Because if you are getting to pocket the difference, then you just want to not give as much of it away as you can. So, um, but the, the, the managed care side um, makes it harder to do, but I think we absolutely still can do uh, substance abuse treatment in your Medicaid program. I would say maybe a tech on the fourth thing. A lot of IV drug users um, are living in really destitute conditions, um, and many um, don't have permanent shelter or housing, right? Um, and so uh, Utah has, in the last 13 years, cut their chronic homelessness population by 95% using an intervention called Housing First. And what that means is, so most shelters if you want, if you're homeless and you want to stay there, you have to meet certain criteria, right? You have to not be using drugs, you have to be sober, that sort of thing. Um, and like, that makes sense because a lot of people who stay in homeless shelters like have young children and like you can't have people who are like blitzed hanging out with like children. Um, at the same time, it means that you're turning away a lot of people who need help. And so the Iowa City shelter is actually uh, just starting a housing first model and basically what housing first means is that if you give people housing first then it's a lot easier for them to get sober and to get clean right because you can get them under a roof you can help them get a job you can get treatment and you actually end up saving money because it's a heck of a lot easier to treat somebody if you know where they are in the apartment rather than treating them in an emergency room down at VU right so uh, exploring a, a program similar to Housing First that could actually end chronic homelessness is not a direct a way of getting at the opioid crisis, but I think it would actually help stabilize some of that population and actually save taxpayers money and put them on the path to sobriety. Uh, but you can't do it overnight, you know? Um, you gotta do it over uh, a, a way that's actually medically safe. Um, you talked about how um, the state um, basically reduced the minimum wage from 10 to 10 to 25 for yep. all municipalities. Yep. Um, in counties, yeah. What? In counties. In counties, yeah. 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 
Um, and uh, there's also the threat of the state legislature taking the back bill. Um, hey, so, that's right. Yep. So how would you go about supporting cities and counties across yeah, Iowa? You know, you'd think that if you were the party of local control, you'd think that this would be a slam dunk, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, look, I think we should just raise the state minimum wage. Um, I think there are some areas where raising it to 1010 would probably be tough, but the reality is if we're not willing to raise the minimum wage when we're at, you know, 2.9% unemployment in the state of Iowa, when the heck are we going to raise the minimum wage, you know? Uh, especially because you look at the, how the cost of living is going up, the price of gas is going up, uh, all these tariffs, by the way, what that doing is it might, it might not seem like a big deal at first. If you notice some of the losses of Iowa farmers, the cost of your day-to-day -day goods is going up. That's what tariffs do. Uh, and so the cost of living is going up, the cost of gas is going up, wages are still flat, right? Um, and here's actually, I, this blew my mind. I saw this today. Um, sorry, I think in charts, this is what grad school did to me. Actually, I already thought in charts, but it made it worse. Um, if you look at uh, the increase in uh, hourly compensation, inflation, uh, they're basically the same thing. So like wages have increased just a little bit more than inflation. The cost of deductibles, do you know, do, do know what deductibles are? Okay, I'll explain the deductibles in a second, but they've, they've basically gone up like 80%. It's like, uh, uh, what they, no, they've gone up like 160%. They've basically gone up eight times faster than wages. So a deductible, so if you have, it's easy to use claim car insurance. So you pay two things when you have insurance. You pay a premium, which is like what you pay every month or every year, and that's just the, that's the cost of having insurance. A deductible is the money that you pay out of your own pocket before the insurance kicks in. So let's say you're paying 500 bucks a year for your car insurance, and you have a $500 deductible. So you send Geico 500 bucks, and you get in a car crash, and there's like $10,000 worth of damage. You pay the first $500. Geico pays the next 9,500. So you've actually paid a total of $1,000, right? Geico's paid $9,500. And that's how, that's what a deductible is. With health insurance, deductibles are a lot higher than $500 for the most part. Um, in fact, there's some pr uh, plans where deductibles are $10,000. Now, if you don't make a lot of money, if like, let's say you're a minimum wage worker and you're making $14,000 a year and you have to pay a $10,000 deductible, well, you might as well not have health insurance, right? Um, and deductibles, have grown eight times faster than wages have over the last 15 years. So uh, that's a huge, huge problem. Um, when it comes to, and that's part of why it's so important that we get wages moving in the right direction, and also why healthcare, long term, huge issue. In terms of the backfill, uh, that is the wonkiest question I think I might have ever gotten in one of these, uh, like, meet and I'm including in, like, meeting with, you know, adults. Not that you're not adults, but, you know, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, look, so uh, the short version of this is um, property taxes. None of you own homes, so you don't pay property taxes. Um, but people who own homes have to pay a certain amount of money every year to a bunch of different government entities. It gets kind of divvied up between like your city, the state, the school board, uh, the county. And Republicans in 2013 cut property taxes commercial owners in a pretty big way. Uh, and what that did is it, is it meant that every cities, counties, school boards, all of their revenues dropped dramatically. And the state government said, we will backfill that decrease in revenue with this thing called the backfill. And cities, especially small towns, really depend on it to make their budgets work. Uh, and Republicans this year were threatened, they're kind of monkeying around with their tax bill saying, well, we might not actually put the backfill in not send that to cities, and that would have been catastrophic. Uh, now, thankfully, they got the message, um, and they pulled that, that idea, but it was, it was a promise that was made, and it's a promise that has to be kept. I think we need to revisit the 2013 commercial property tax cut. Republicans told us it was gonna pay for itself, and it didn't, like, it, it, tax cuts never pay for that. I mean, like, maybe the Kennedy tax cuts, you know, but that was it, you know, so. We're on the wrong side of the left curve. And that's another weird one, the economic thing, don't worry about it. Anyone else? Another question for you. Yeah. So, um, in the past you've held yourself up as a proud product of Iowa's public education yeah. system, specifically yeah. like Iowa City. Yeah. Um, 
According to one Forbes ranking report, yeah. uh, I was now ranked as having the 16th best, or 16th um, overall public education system, and it ranks 35th hey, on there. Hey, how you doing? Oh, we're just saying, talking hey. a little ballsy. Come on over. Yeah, come on over if you want. Sweet. Well, I've seen something else, but you can talk um, So it ranks 16th in the overall ranking, yeah. and then 35th in the safety ranking. Yep. So um, if elected, what would you do to transform Iowa back into like a national leader? For, yeah, for so you know, when I was growing up, and hey, Iowa public schools were like, we went back and forth to Minnesota, for, like best in the whole country. And that is not the case anymore. You can cut it up any way you want, Forbes, whatever else. US, you know, it's just, it's, it's clearly not the case that we are the nation's leaders. And part of that is actually has nothing to do with funding. Part of it just has to do with culture. And I think, unfortunately, everything that I've heard from teachers and from administration is that there's a, a real compliance culture at the Department of Education in Iowa. And so they, like, they set rules and they're really focused on making sure that people follow their rules. And I think that if you look at states that have passed Iowa, like Massachusetts, um, there's a lot of innovation happening there. You know, and you know, sometimes we gotta be careful. Innovation is code word for charter schools, which is code for trying to bust up teachers unions and I, that's not what I want to do. Um, but there have to be ways for us to empower teachers and administration figure out new ways of doing things in their classrooms. You know, I was just today in Clarence, Iowa, which is a town of about a thousand people. Um, so uh, we are in Johnson County, which is, you know, right in this. Cedar County is like this, and Clarence is like here, we're here. So uh, there's like Highway 30. So it's like a little group of four towns along Highway 30, and Clarence is a town of about, I don't know, a thousand people or so. And um, I was getting a tour of the, the it's a junior high and high school consolidated uh, school that has all four of those towns. Their kids go to Clarence for junior and senior high. And the superintendent was saying to me, you know, look, we, we've got different pots of money and we can only use it for what the funds are allocated for. Uh, but like, we would love to have more operational funds and like a little bit less facilities funds. Now our facilities still need work, don't get me wrong, but like we don't want teachers spending $300 on school supplies. Uh, and so figuring out ways that we can use the money that's there uh, and maybe eliminate some of the strings that are attached to it would be good. Um, and then I think the last thing, part of it too is spending. I mean, our eight of the last 10 years have been the lowest on record for the allowable growth by the state investing. I mean, currently, we're growing investment in K-12 below education. And if your 80% of your cost for uh, public for a public school district is payroll, right, teachers, you know, like how do we compete with Illinois, right? I mean, your dad, right, went to Rock Island, and, you know, I Minnesota, Missouri, you, you know, like, I don't know how you're, I don't know how we're supposed to compete if we're, if we're increasing our spending it below the rate of inflation, let alone you know, like actually growing it. Um, I would have spent a lot of money on education. That's good. I would can spend it better, and I think that we should spend more. Like it's, it's what we got. It's what makes Iowa Iowa. You know, and unfortunately, we're 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 losing that. And if we want young people to move back, like that's critical. I mean, that's absolutely critical. So I care a lot about. Any other questions? Yeah, no, Jake, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so I like, I I am like a really big advocate for mental health myself, and so like I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your action plan. Like I know you said that the system that's currently in place with like counties forming regions isn't necessarily the best. So would you go back to like in each individual county? Like yeah. For so I don't think going back to counties is the right way to do it. I would like to see. Uh, a, a statewide mm -hmm. payer. I think this is going to make it a lot easier for providers. I think it'll make it a lot easier for patients. Um, actually, reversing Medicaid privatization is a huge part of it. Excuse me, we need more beds. Um, I was currently 50th in the country in public psychiatric beds per capita. Um, 